Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the annual Louise McBee Lecture. Thank you for your interest in our speaker this morning and also for joining us to honor Dr. Louise McBee. This lecture series was launched in 1989 and is now in its 29th year. This event holds the distinction of being the nation's longest standing lecture series dedicated to the topic of higher education. This lecture honors Louise McBee, one of Georgia's best known and most revered citizens. Dr. McBee was the UGA Vice President for Academic Affairs Emerita and former state representative. She was a trailblazer in both positions. Dr. McBee completed a PhD at the Ohio State University and she held academic positions in Virginia and Tennessee before moving to the University of Georgia as Dean of Women in 1963. At that time, it was not recognized what an influential force she would become at the University of Georgia and in the state and, over, and in the nation over the next five decades. At UGA, Dr. McBee climbed the administrative ranks using her keen insight into people and problems to manage student unrest and the social changes that rocked campuses in the 1960s and 70s, to advocate tirelessly for faculty governance in academic affairs, and to advocate for women faculty, underserved students, and increased access to post-secondary education overall. In essence, she was a role model for us all and a bellwether in excellence, equity, and inclusion. After her retirement from UGA in 1991, Dr. McBee did not retire to a much deserved quiet private life. Rather, she built on her career as a highly successful university administrator and faculty member and she ran and was elected to the Georgia House of Representatives for six terms before stepping down in 2004. Throughout her legislative service, she was known for her problem-solving skills, fairness, and integrity. After her first term, no one would run against Louise McBee. The humiliation of a resounding defeat was a certainty. In her final term in the House, and much to our delight, Dr. McBee served as chair of the House Higher Education Committee. Louise could articulate issues, explain the pros and cons of policies and proposals, seek out supporters and win over opponents. She reached across the aisle. She believed in government as a learning community. No shutdowns under her watch. It is noteworthy that in 2014, UGA President Jerry Moorhead awarded Dr. McBee an inaugural President's Medal for longstanding, long extraordinary contributions to the students, faculty, academic, and research programs of the University of Georgia. In that same year, he awarded to Dr. McBee's mentee, Dr. Tom Dyer, the other inaugural award. To this day, when I visit with Dr. McBee, she asks about the university, the Institute of Higher Education, and her beloved dogs. It is an honor to know Louise McBee, to hold the lecture in her name, and to house the McBee professorship in the Institute of Higher Education. Please join me in thanking Dr. McBee for her outstanding contributions to the state of Georgia, the University of Georgia, and higher education overall. It's now my pleasure to recognize Professor Eric Ness, who will introduce our distinguished speaker.
Thank you, Dr. Morris. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Michelle Asha Cooper to deliver this year's Louise McBee Lecture. Dr. Cooper is a leading voice in higher education on the national and international stage, and Michelle is a friend of the Institute of Higher Education, having served on advisory panels for research projects and given presentations to IHE faculty and students. In fact, I first met Michelle when we were graduate students through mutual friends, Angie Bell and Rob Anderson, who were then graduate students here at UGA and now serve as IHE fellows. At the time, Michelle held a rather significant day job as Deputy Director for the Advisory Committee on Student Financial Aid. The Advisory Committee was an independent, nonpartisan commission created by Congress to provide advice and counsel on higher education and student financial aid policy issues to Congress and to the Secretary of Education. As Deputy Director, she interacted with policymakers, oversaw all policy research activities, and managed day-to-day -day operations. Michelle did all of this while completing her doctoral program at the University of Maryland, including writing her dissertation on Dreams Deferred, examining post-secondary education aspirations among racial and ethnic groups. Dr. Cooper also previously earned a bachelor's degree from the College of Charleston, her hometown, and master's degree from Cornell University. Almost 10 years ago now, Dr. Cooper became president of the Institute of Higher Education Policy, or IHEP, one of the nation's most effective voices in championing access and success. Dr. Cooper is responsible for stewardship of the organization's rich history of addressing the educational needs of today's students, particularly underserved students, many of whom are low income, students of color, and adults. She also oversees the organization's expansive research portfolio and the analytic expertise used to inform and shape national, state, local, and institutional policy reform. This includes often providing advice and counsel to congressional and state legislative staff. She has also testified before the Education Committees of the United States Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. Dr. Cooper is a thought leader and a highly sought after contributor to the national discourse on higher education, providing commentary to media outlets that span the partisan spectrum from C-SPAN to Fox News to NPR, as well as the Chronicle of Higher Education, Huffington Post, Inside Higher Ed, USA Today, and the Washington Post. In 2012 and 2013, which Michelle was named by Politic 365 as a game changer, which recognized her among a distinguished group of bipartisan multicultural leaders whose foresight and engagement in both public and private sectors are critical to America's domestic success and global leadership. Dr. Cooper is a recipient of several other awards, recognizing her work advancing economic and educational opportunities, including the prestigious Aspen Institute Presidential Fellowship, the Center for Nonprofit Advancements, Excellence, and Chief Executive Leadership Award. Michelle has also been featured multiple times in diverse issues in higher education and Essence magazines. Finally, in 2011, Dr. Cooper and her staff at IHEP were recognized by the Association for the Study of Higher Education, ASH, by showing, for showing exemplary leadership to the higher education community. As you can see, Michelle is a fierce advocate for equity and social justice in higher education. She does so through strong leadership skills, with political and business savvy, and by building relationship and consensus among diverse constituencies. We are honored to have her here with us this morning. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Ashley Cooper to deliver the Louise McBee Lecture. Thank you. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, 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 good. So glad it's not raining today. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Morris, and also you, Dr. Eric Ness, for the introduction and for this invitation. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I also want to thank Adriana Gonzalez for meeting me this morning and making sure that I got to the campus safe and sound. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the introduction, Eric, was quite humbling. Um, I appreciate everything you said, and it probably also explains why I'm sometimes a little tired. It's been busy several years. Um, and in fact, I have known Eric for quite some time, and what he doesn't know is that he caught my eye when I was actually in graduate school. Um, he was doing a presentation at an ASH conference, and he was still working at the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, and he did this amazing, amazing presentation. Um, and I then used Rob and Angie 
to broker an introduction. So it was a little, <laughs> so it's been a while, but I have been impressed with Eric's work for quite some time and been really happy to continue to support one another's careers and happy to uh, extend myself to the Institute for Higher Education through his invitations whenever possible. So thank you very much. I am actually very, very honored to be the featured speaker for the Dr. Louise McBee lecture series. And in preparation for this visit, I spent quite a bit of time learning more about Dr. McBee. And as Dr. Morrison's introduction revealed, she is truly, truly a phenomenal woman. Her contributions to the University of Georgia, to the state of Georgia, and to the field of higher education have been immense. And I was thrilled when I had a chance to actually meet her in face, face to face this morning. Um, I spent some time, and I want to say publicly, Dr. McBee, I really thank you for being a trailblazer and for standing up for women and advocating for equity during an era when those conversations were much harder than they are, than they are today. So kudos to Dr. Louise McBee. Let's give her another round of applause. Now I bring greetings on behalf of my colleagues at the Institute for Higher Education Policy, an organization that we simply refer to as IHEP. IHEP is a policy, research, and advocacy organization located in Washington, D.C. We focus on issues of college access, college success, and affordability. And in our work, we place special emphasis on students, especially students who have been underserved by the post-secondary system. Primarily, those are students of color, low-income students, working class students, and adults. This year at IHEP, we celebrate our 25th anniversary. And we are very excited and we're very proud of all that we've been able to accomplish over the last two and a half decades. We are especially pleased that so many of our partners now recognize us as one of the most effective voices for educating policymakers and post-secondary leaders on the strategies and the solutions for educating or for really attending to our nation's most pressing educational challenges. And it is these educational challenges that brings me here today and will be the focus of this lecture. And the lecture's theme is A New Hope for a Better Tomorrow, Tackling Post-Secondary Challenges Today. And I really believe that a college education should offer all students the chance to transform their life and to secure a better, a better future for themselves and their families. Yet the promise of higher education remains unfulfilled for far too many of our students. And during this lecture, I hope to share some information about what inspires my commitment to do this work and offer some details about the work that we will be doing at the Institute for Higher Education Policy and also give you some avenues for your own involvement in the policy making process. Now, like I said, I'm really happy to be here. And when I was walking over this morning with Adriana, I told her that I love visiting college campuses. I love college towns. And I try to visit several times a year. And it especially feels good to be here at the home of the Georgia Bulldogs. Go Bulldogs. Um, I started my college career working in student affairs. And even though I have not worked on a college campus in recent years, I have such great respect for the work that you all do. So whenever possible, I love to come to campuses and return to my roots. Now on my visit today, I have brought my 10 year old, no, my 10 month old. <laughs> my 10 month old, I keep looking back to make sure the slides actually are showing up behind me. But I brought my 10 month old daughter, that's her up there. And even though she's not in the room with us right now, she is here in Athens and she is my traveling companion these days. And before we leave, we're gonna stop by the bookstore so I can make sure she gets some UGA baby gear. Um, now, when my daughter was born, I can honestly say that it felt like a roller coaster ride filled with unexpected dips, twists, and turns. Anybody here ever ridden on a roller coaster? Show of hands. Anybody here like riding on roller coasters? Okay, so for you roller coaster people, you know that a roller coaster ride 
is often filled with fear, angst, and moments of disorientation, right? But at the same time, it can be exhilarating and oddly energizing. And these are the adjectives that describe my life these days. Fear, angst, disorientation, exhilarating, and oddly energizing. <laughs> Um, my baby girl has also intensified some of my inherent qualities. For example, I have always been someone willing to extend myself and go to great lengths to protect the people and the things that I care deeply about. But now, since her arrival, I feel that that fighter, protector, warrior instinct has been amplified. And instinctually, I want to make sure I protect my daughter from all harm falls, cuts, and germs. And there have been a lot of germs going around this winter, and I want to protect her from them. I also want to protect her innocence. I want to keep her safe from all the evils in this world. I want to make sure that her world is one that is filled with rainbows and blue skies. I want her to live in a world that is fair, just, and equitable, one that Georgia's own Dr. Martin Luther King would describe as a nation where she will not be judged by the color of her skin, but by the content of her character. I want her to grow up in a world that is free, open, and peaceful. One that another one of Georgia's native sons, President Jimmy Carter, would describe as a place of peace, where our leaders keep the peace and tell the truth. Finally, I want my daughter to grow up with a sharp mind and be educated in institutions where opportunities exist for everyone, and not just for those who are lucky enough to be born in certain zip codes. In this country, luck and zip codes should not be the determinants of access or opportunity, but for many, it is. And to ensure that that does not continue to happen, I think we need to remember the advice of Georgia's very own Dr. Louise McBee, who said, education and the world will change, they will be better, and we will make them better. And she is right. Education and the world will be better because we will make them better, not just for my daughter, but for your children, grandchildren, neighbors, friends, and every kid in America. In my work at the Institute for Higher Education Policy, we seek change. We seek radical, transformative change. And we want to do more than just tinker at the margins. We are very deliberate in our efforts to educate, inform, and influence policies that will help students enter and graduate from college successfully. We want today's students to have a real chance one that allows them to not just transform their lives, but also be leaders in their communities and improve our society. And to do this work, my colleagues and I sometimes have to have tough conversations. And even though folks don't always agree with us, they still engage with us and they respect us because we have a reputation for being credible, fact-based, and evidence-driven. You see, we welcome all people and all perspectives. And we certainly believe that everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but everyone is not entitled to their own facts, okay? You can't just make up or disregard the facts when you don't like them. And let me run down a few facts about the status of education in America. It is a fact that 20% of America's children live in extreme poverty. And in many places, our educational system concentrates these students in K-12 schools where we invest and expect very little. It is a fact that our students today are very diverse. Over one half are from low and moderate income families. More than 40% are adults and people of color. More than 800,000 are dreamers. More than one-third attend part-time, and nearly 20% are holding down full-time jobs while they attend college. It is a fact that our existing post-secondary data infrastructure, the system by which we collect and report key demographic and outcomes information, is a, compli a complicated, 
duplicative, disjointed mess. The system does not count all students, so it can't count all outcomes. And it doesn't answer critical questions for students, policymakers, and institutional leaders. And it is a fact that the purchasing power of the Pell Grant continues to decline. And the vast majority of colleges are unaffordable for most students, except the highest income students. Now these are just a few of the facts that we must address in tackling today's post-secondary access and success challenges. And I truly believe that now was the time to reverse these trends and pursue policies that can narrow long-standing inequities in our educational system. And to be effective, we must seize this moment and prioritize and centralize equity in our work, equity. Now when I talk about equity, I like to begin by defining the word because I think the word is being used inappropriately. Very often the words diversity, equality, inclusion, and equity are used interchangeably and they mean different things. For example, diversity is about difference, equality is about sameness, and equity is about fairness. Very important, critical distinctions. These words are not synonyms. And this visual behind me captures the nuance between equality and equity. And as you can see, there's a fence and there is an obstacle. And in the first illustration, we see that all of these individuals have equally sized boxes. But just because they have equally sized boxes does not necessarily mean they have an equal perspective over the fence. In fact, they do not. In the second illustration, we see that the boxes are sized to accommodate for differences and allow each individual the same viewpoint above the fence. This is equity. This is about fairness. And sometimes when we deal with equity, we have to recognize that special groups require special accommodations. Now, when it comes to equity, we have to remember that we're not just striving for equity and accommodations or parity and outcomes. That's good, but true attention to equity requires much, much more. We must also address the underlying systemic barriers that created the inequity in the first place. And here, if you look at the third illustration, we have a perspective on reality. And this visual highlights the need to understand root causes because we should get an idea or want to know why is that one guy in the hole and this other guy, we can't even see him because his viewpoint is extending upwards towards heaven. So to truly be equity-minded, we must interrogate core issues. We must seek structural and systemic change, and we must move beyond the status quo. And this is important to keep in mind, especially for those who work or desire or seek to work in the policy context. Because in the policy context, the need for simplicity often leads us down a path of unintended consequences for underrepresented students. And you will hear, and I often hear people say to me, oh, but you know, a rising tide will lift all boats. And that is the mentality that starts to pervade. But when you are equity-minded, you will come to realize that it is true, that a rising tide can lift all boats, but for some people, the marginalized, the poor, they don't even have a, they don't have a boat. They don't even have a boat. So without intentional and targeted attempts to address these inequities, the gaps that we already have, gaps in attainment, gaps in opportunity, gaps in achievement, will continue to grow. It is also to, important to remember the diversity of today's students. As I mentioned earlier, significant numbers of our students today are adults, people of color, and students from low-income and working-class backgrounds. And growing percentages of our students are also active duty military, they're veterans, they're immigrants, and they are non-native English speakers. And according to the Carl Vinson Institute right here at UGA, 
More than one million families in this state already speak a language other than English in their homes. One million families already. And these are characteristics of today's students. But you have to keep in mind that many of the long-standing policies and practices that we have in place right now were not created with these students in mind. And that's the disconnect. So our policies and our practices cannot readily support their needs because they were not intended to do so necessarily in the first place. And at IHEP, that is something we want to change. We want to do something about that. And we believe that policies and practices must be created for today's students, and they must be aligned for their success. And we believe that the most effective policy proposals will promote college affordability, will drive college completion, include often forgotten uh, populations such as the incarcerated, and be grounded in clear and compelling evidence. Now I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to start with the first one. First, it is important that policies strengthen and protect need-based financial aid. Let's see, will it highlight? There we go. To fulfill the promise of the American dream, higher education must be as accessible to the daughters of hourly shift workers as they are to the sons of bankers and doctors. And for far too long, the transformative benefits of higher education have been disproportionately enjoyed by the wealthy, the well-resourced, and the well-connected. And too many of our underrepresented students are shot out of colleges and universities simply because they lack the ability to pay. And this college affordability problem is fundamentally one of inequity. The Pell Grant, however, is the cornerstone of federal student aid and has been so for decades. It has provided assistance to hardworking students to pursue their education. Therefore, at IHEP, we certainly believe that this should continue to be the case, but we should increase the maximum Pell Grant award to reverse its declining purchasing power. We also want to see it permanently indexed to inflation, and we want program funding to be mandatory and not discretionary. Now, some of that may sound a little bit technical, a little bit wonky, but essentially what I'm saying is that I want students to be able to trust that Pell Grant dollars will help them pay for college. And students should also be able to count on the government to stand behind its promise of making sure that Pell funding is available for students who need it, when they need it, and every time they need it. In addition to federal student aid, state aid also plays a very important role. And increasingly, states are enacting free college programs. And while there is certainly value in these programs, too many of them are starting to redirect precious aid dollars away from the, the state's neediest students. And we must ensure that our policies, our financial aid policies, however well-intentioned, do not inadvertently reinforce existing inequities. Second, we want policies to spur and drive degree completion, especially for underrepresented students and students who have paused their studies. Helping students who have stopped out, dropped out, or simply paused their education get back on track presents a huge opportunity. For today's students, many of whom who balance full-time jobs or care for dependents while they are pursuing college, many times these uh, things get interrupted by their life obligations. And at present, only 41% of Americans have attained a post-secondary degree. And in the state of Georgia, that is, percentage is 39%. And nearly one in five, that's 35 million Americans, have earned some college credits but have no degree. No, we didn't go the wrong way. Okay, here, um, and that equates to a little bit more than 700,000 people who fall into this category. Let's see, where's that slide? That one. 35 million, some college credits, but no degree. And in Georgia, that's 13% who represent some college and no degree, and that equates to about 700,000 people. Labor economists have predicted that by 2020, two-thirds of all U.S. jobs will require a college degree or a college credential. 2020, 
It's 2018, so two years from now. So it is important for us to take steps to re-engage students who have paused, stopped out, or dropped out. And at IHEP, we believe that we can close equity gaps and re-engage these students through an effort that we call degree reclamation. And degree reclamation targets students who have already amassed enough college credits or are near, are compl are near completers, they, meaning they have almost enough towards their degree requirements. And this scalable strategy has already helped more than 20,000 students earn degrees, and we have found that the strategies that we've put in place can easily be implemented across institutions and across state systems. Similar programs have sometimes been called reverse transfer. Now the research is abundantly clear, education pays. Students who earn a college degree earn more over the course of their lifetime, plain and simple, plain and simple. But education pays nothing, or even worse, it saddles students with debt when they are, uh, when they are unable to pay back the educational costs. And that doesn't help anyone in that particular case. So we feel it's really important that we help these students get across the degree completion finish line. And third, we believe that policies must help invisible populations. Let's see if we get there. There we go. <laughs> invisible populations. And for us, the invisible population that we have decided to focus on are the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. Now from our inception, IHEP has always centralized minority or invisible populations that have not often been discussed in post-secondary policy efforts. After about 25 years of researching the access and success barriers facing the incarcerated and the formerly incarcerated, I am happy to report that there is finally, finally growing bipartisan support for this population and people from both sides of the aisle are starting to realize that it can be a wise investment. Ex-offenders who participate in educational programs are 40% less likely to re-offend and far more likely to find a job and contribute to their communities upon release. Every dollar invested in prison education saves the public at least $4 on re-imprisonment costs. Now barriers to college access and success for these students, barriers like the 1994 ban on Pell Grants for the incarcerated reinforces cycles of poverty and mass incarceration that disproportionately impact communities of color and cost the taxpayers more money in the long term. So we believe that by reinstating the Pell eligibility and lifting the ban on federal student loan access for this population, that we can actually help more students see the transformative benefits of higher education. And just last week, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos described this as a very good and interesting possibility. I think that's good news. I think I'm happy about it. <laughs> and finally, policies must strengthen our post-secondary data infrastructure. Let's get a picture. That is our post-secondary data infrastructure. College is a pathway out of poverty, and low-income students are five times more likely to climb the economic ladder if they earn a college degree than if they don't. Yet when it comes to students who go to college, we actually know that where they go to college ultimately shapes their, uh, their opportunity. Yet, student outcomes can vary dramatically across institutions and across programs, even for those enrolling similar types of students. So to inform student choice and responsibly steward taxpayer dollars, policymakers need evidence, clear, accurate evidence about what works. And the lack of quality data prevents evidence-based policy making and stalls progress toward equity and success for all students. Now, although we have plenty of data from various sources, our data uh, infrastructure looks like what you see behind me. And it is best characterized as burdensome, duplicative, incomplete, and disconnected. And it really is this, we spend a lot of time trying to study and understand the infrastructure, and this is what it looks like. But not in, in addition to it being complicated and confusing, it actually fails to answer critical questions and does not capture the diversity of today's students.
For example, we cannot answer key questions about student access, success, outcomes, and equity, such as the ones that you see posted here behind me. Questions like, what are the national completion rates for part-time and transfer students of color? Which students go on to succeed in the workforce? How does college access affordability and completion vary by race, ethnicity, and income? These are very basic, very, very basic questions. And in an era where some people question the value of a college degree and wonder, is college really worth it? Or should everyone go to college? We need to be armed with better data to answer these very basic questions. Data that counts all outcomes and counts all students. We need to make sure that we find solutions to our data infrastructure that will reduce institutional reporting burden and also maintain the highest privacy and security standards. At IHEP, we recognize that the use of high quality data is necessary to drive improvements in student outcomes and in educational equity, which is why we lead the POSEC Data Collaborative. With many of our POSEC data partners, we call for an improved data infrastructure that would aggregate existing information through a secure, privacy-protected, student-level data network. Not quite. Okay. The IHEP team is committed to combating these educational challenges that have long plagued our educational system, and we intend to focus these, our efforts on these issues that I've been discussing. We also intend to keep an eye out for other issues that might surface, issues that are brought on by changing demographics, increasing labor market needs, and the expansion of technology into the educational space. This is what we intend to make as our contribution. But my question to you is, what will be yours? Now, many years ago, when I worked on a college campus, I did not give much thought to the policymaking process. But in hindsight, I have come to realize that faculty and administrators are at the front line for policy decisions. You all see the challenges and you create solutions almost daily. You witness all kinds of developments and notice student behaviors before many others do. You see it first. You deal with it first. So I would like to think that you all are the first responders. Your work in the policy arena may even resemble bookends. At the front end, you are the ones who recognizes that there is a problem and that something needs to be done. And at the back end, you are expected to implement the solutions or the policies uh, that have come through either the federal channels, the state channels, or the institutional channels, channels. But very, very few of you are in the middle inserting your voice, inserting your research, inserting your expertise into the decision-making process. Now, my colleagues and I believe that the most successful policy solutions are informed by coalitions of individuals and organizations committed to shared goals. Individuals such as civil rights and advocacy leaders, individuals such as researchers, institutional leaders, faculty, and students. You all know what works on the ground. You all know the students whose stories, when coupled with strong data, can provide policymakers with important evidence in their quest for change. You all have the networks to bring other institutional voices to the table. A researcher and an advocate like me absolutely needs people like you. But I warn you, though, that people often get frustrated by the policymaking process for a number of reasons. Politics is one, but another reason is that they get frustrated and don't necessarily recognize that there is a difference between describing change and creating change. For policy leaders, there's definitely value in both. Describing change illuminates the problems, puts the spotlight on it, shows you what the context is, highlights many of the trends, and many people can do this well. Creating change is much harder much, much harder. It takes strategy, case making, and partnerships. When you create change, you educate the decision makers on the problems, you help identify solutions, you help pilot and evaluate options, and you help negotiate the trade-offs and the setbacks. 
Each of you can do one or more of these things, and policymakers absolutely want to hear from you because they like people, like I like to say, people in their backyards. You are their constituents. So I invite you here to become change agents, change agents for your students, for your campus, and for your communities. And I invite you to stand with me and to stand with I have been doing so. We really value your experience, and we would love for you to tell us more about the practices that you have adopted to better support student success. We also want to hear about the challenges that you're facing. We want to know about that too. And we believe that together we can help policymakers craft solutions that ensure that my daughter, your children, your students have the opportunity to reach their full potential by participating and succeeding in higher education. As Louise McBee has already said, education and the world will change. They will be better, and we will make them better. Thank you. Um, I find that, I don't know if everyone heard her question, but she, her question is about the skepticism about the value of higher education and whether or not people are not um, moved to act by data. I would say that I'm certainly, um, deal, we deal a lot with the skepticism about the value of higher education and when it comes to data, it's not that people aren't moved, but they're frustrated by what to access and where to find it. So we have lots of data out there, but it's not necessarily informing our decisions in ways that are meaningful and are valuable. So when we go in and we talk to leaders, they are very frustrated by the fact that they can't answer these basic questions like the ones that I mentioned. Um, questions that look at not just the trends, but are able to disaggregate the trends for certain particular groups of students. Um, so we've gotten a lot of attention to the conversation about data and our people are more and more interested in trying to figure out ways to streamline all that we already have out there so we can make sure that we are answering the questions that need to be answered for today's students. Um, the other thing I would say is that when it comes to data, people are wanting it not just to answer the questions, but they want it to drive improvements. They really want to link what they see and what they understand to things that they can change in their classroom practice, things that they can change in institutional policy, and ripple that up to state and federal le levels. And so we find that there's frustration among various levels of policy making um, without the, in the inability to really figure out what works for, and what works for certain groups of students. Well, we actually have a statement that we're gonna be putting out and in in hopefully soon. So I have not been able to pour through it as, as quickly and as deeply as I would like, but we're optimistic that Pell funding remains in there. From what we've told, it's still there, and, and we're hopeful about that. But we wanna make sure that we don't have to keep having these yearly annual debates about funding for Pell. We wanna see that there's always gonna be money there and that students can guarantee uh, know that there's a guarantee associated with it. But in terms of some of the other proposals, we've not, I've not been able to look at it as closely, but I know the folks on my team are. So if you're on our list, sir, you'll get the news flash hopefully in the next 48 hours. <laughs> and if you don't mind, when you ask a question, if you can just say who you are, because I, I, I like to know who I'm talking to. In the case of you, Dr. Hearn, I know I'm talking to you. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think the coalition is, is starting to grow. We've been in this space for 25 years and there's not been a whole lot of others in the higher education space looking at incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. Um, oftentimes when we've been studying these populations, we've been studying them on unfunded dollars um, just because we've not been able to secure grant funding from our foundations to pursue it. So we start, we're starting to see the tides change in them. More foundations are coming to us and at least asking good questions and engaging in conversation. So I, I, I'm, I'm really excited that possibilities might be changing there. Um, in terms of our work when it comes to this po population, we're looking at it from two sides. One is the policy angle where we you know, have deep expertise and we are looking to work with people who are looking at the practice level because we wanna make sure that the programs that are in these correctional facilities are ones of quality. We wanna make sure that the individuals who are there are actually getting something that will translate into a degree or credential 
when they complete their time served. And one of the policies that we've seen that's a hindrance to that is that two and four year institutions are not necessarily accepting those credit hours upon release. So they're not automatically a transfer process. So that's a barrier that's um, a challenge. And also you recognize the one around online technology as well. Um, I was just talking to someone who is doing some work at a facility in Connecticut who told me that they can't have Wi-Fi, but they have typewriters. And I said, well, I think a typewriter is more dangerous physically than a Wi-Fi, and, and surely they are, she agrees, but you know, we still have to get over that online hurdle that you referenced. But many of the partners that we have been working on, like I said, the, the tent is expanding slowly. Um, it's primarily us partnering with others who have been in the criminal justice space and not so much in the higher education space. But the more I go out and talk about these things and the more that my colleagues are, have been talking about them, we've started to see more of a ripple in terms of the higher education support. Um, in terms of our policymakers at the federal level, I would say that this is an area that, like I mentioned earlier, it, it really does have a growing bipartisan basis. But like a lot of things, um, different groups are interested in them for different reasons. And one of the themes that resonate primarily uh, well across the board, regardless with Democrats and Republicans, is that everyone's interested in making sure we have people who can fill these jobs. Jobs that are currently either unfilled or will be unfilled in the future. And so to the extent that we can help formerly and, and currently incarcerated individuals learn trades, learn skills that can translate into real jobs is an area where we've seen bipartisan support and coalition building starting to emerge quite rapidly. I don't know the answer. I am watching the tea leaves and the trends just like everyone else is. Um, I know from the policy angle when the gainful employment provisions came out, we saw several of those uh, for-profit institutions, not just the online ones, but some of the ones that are sort of hybrids, brick and mortar and online, vanish because they weren't meeting their gainful employment provisions. Um, the Trump administration has started to roll back um, or it has a desire, I should say, to roll back some of those provisions. And so we will see what happens as a result of that, but I don't think anyone's able to yet predict sort of where they will, how, the, the role they will continue to play in the space. But it's a trend worth watching. And for researchers or students who are looking for research topics, it's certainly one worth, worth studying. Hmm. I've not, seen any, I've not seen or heard any indi indication that that will happen, not currently. I do think there are groups of people, coalitions for example, who would like to see that happen, but I've not seen that emerge yet as a trend. So I have not, for, from, for the leaders that we've been working with, and now, you know, keep in mind we work with leaders who are on the committees, the education committees in both House and Senate, and when we're called into states, we are called into states where they have education committees who want to work with us, and we work with the leaders from the Republican and the Democrats on, in those committees. And from a committee level perspective, the commitment to education seems just as strong and robust as it's ever been, to be perfectly honest. The things that committees are concerned about are outcomes and funding. And so you'll see a proliferation of performance-based outcomes programs across states. You've seen a proliferation around people uh, being frustrated with data and, and, and the ability to assess program quality because the data can't really underscore those questions um, and the answers that they desire. But in terms of really feeling that polarization, I have not felt that. Yeah. <laughs>